Hello dear students. Today we are going to discuss the topic phloem unloading. The main objectives of the today's topic are number 1 to study phloem and its components involved in transport of assimilates. Number 2 to learn about symplastic phloem unloading. Number 3 to learn about apoplastic phloem unloading and its subtypes. Number 4 to understand the mechanism of phloem unloading. Number 5 to gain knowledge about various routes of phloem unloading and to understand the unloading of phloem assimilates to terminal sinks. First of all, let's have a brief introduction of phloem unloading. The movement of photosynthates from the sieve elements and their distribution to the sink cells that store or metabolize them is known as phloem unloading. Phloem unloading represents a series of cell-to-cell -cell transport steps transferring phloem mobile constituents from phloem to sink tissues or organs to fuel their development or resource storage. Phloem unloading may occur through the symplast or plasmodesmata directly into the SECC complex or sieve element companion cell complex. Alternatively, sucrose may be transported across the mesophyll cell membrane into the apoplastic space. The export of photoassimilate through phloem and their delivery to recipient sink cells is the final step in photoassimilate transport from source to sink. Transport into sink organs such as developing roots, tubers and reproductive structures is termed as import. The following steps are involved in the import of sugars into sink cells. Number 1. Sieve element unloading. This is the process by which imported sugars leave the sieve elements of sink tissues. Number 2. Short distance transport. After sieve element unloading, the sugars are transported to cells in the sink by means of a short distance transport pathway. This pathway has also been called post sieve element transport. Number 3. Storage and Metabolism In the final step of import, sugars are stored or metabolized in sink cells. On reaching the cytoplasm of recipient sink cells, imported photoassimilates can enter metabolic pathways or be compartmented into organelles, for example, amyloplasts, protein bodies and vacuoles. Metabolic fates for photoassimilates include catabolism in respiratory pathways, in biosynthesis for maintenance and growth and storage as macromolecules such as starch and fructans. Compared with phloem loading, phloem unloading and subsequent sink utilization of imported photoassimilates show much variations due to a great diversity of sinks. Sinks vary greatly in structure and function, thereby showing a much broader range of variations, such as morphological, for example, in apices, stems, roots, vegetative, storage and reproductive organs. Number 2. Anatomical, for example, in provascular differentiating sieve elements, protofloem sieve elements lacking companion cells, metafloem sieve element companion cell complexes. Number 3. Developmental, for example, cell division and cell expansion. Number 4. Metabolic, for example, storage of soluble compounds or polymers growth sinks. Now let's see the different pathways of phloem unloading. Once photoassimilate reaches its target sink, it must be unloaded 
from the sieve element companion cell complex into the cells of the zinc tissue. Like phloem loading, phloem unloading may occur via apoplastic or symplastic routes. The pathway of phloem unloading appears to be completely symplastic in some young developing leaves and root tips. Sucrose flows via interconnecting plasmodesmata down a concentration gradient from the sieve element companion cell complex to sites of metabolism in the sink. The gradient and consequently flow into the sink cell is maintained by hydrolyzing sucrose to glucose and fructose. There are two possible apoplastic routes as type 1 and type 2. In principle, the apoplastic step should be located at the site of the sieve element companion cell complex, although this pattern has yet to receive experimental support. The apoplastic step could also be further removed from the sieve elements. When the epiplastic step is in close vicinity of sieve elements, it's called type 2A phloem unloading. And when it is further removed from sieve elements, it's called type 2B phloem unloading. This type 2 arrangement is typical of developing seeds and root tips and appears to be the most common in apoplastic phloem unloading. Release is insensitive to metabolic inhibitors and therefore does not involve any energy dependent carrier. Once in the epiplast, sucrose is hydrolyzed by the enzyme invertase, which is tightly bound to the cell wall and catalyzes the reaction sucrose plus water gives glucose plus fructose. This reaction is essentially irreversible and the hydrolysis products glucose and fructose are actively taken up by the sink cells. Once in the cell they again combine as sucrose and are actively transported into the vacuole for storage. Hydrolysis of sucrose in the epiplast perhaps combined with the irreversibility of the acid invertase reaction serves to maintain the gradient and allows the unloading to continue. This pathway seems to be prominent in seeds of maize, sorghum and pearl millet. The third pathway for phloem unloading indicates that in legumes Sucrose is unloaded into the epiplast by an energy dependent carrier. The nature of the carrier has not been conclusively identified, but evidence to date suggests it is probably the same sucrose H positive co transporter. Now let's move towards the mechanism of phloem unloading. First, we will try to understand the symplasmic transport mechanisms. Symplasmic movement includes intracellular transport, that is, passive transport in meristematic cells, supplemented by cytoplasmic streaming in vacuolated cells. These cells are arranged in series with intercellular transport via plasmodesmal interconnections. In most circumstances, intracellular transport is unlikely to be rate limiting in meristematic or vacuolated cells. The common limiting plasmodesmal transport step is considered to occur passively. Thus, the symplasmic flux is governed by the transplasmodesmal differences in solute chemical potentials, that is, diffusion or pressure that is bulk flow modulated by plasmodesmal conductance. How symplasmic transport is controlled? Long term control of symplasmic phloem unloading could be mediated through developmental shifts in plasmodesmal numbers and in the lengths of their 
ultrastructure that rate limit transport. Short term regulation of symplasmic phloem unloading may be exercised through rapid changes second to minutes in plasmodesmal radii and hence plasmodesmal conductivities or turgor differences. Regulation of unloading through alteration in the concentration or pressure difference enjoys widespread plea. It provides a mechanism where metabolic demand of the recipient sink cells directly determines these differences and hence phloem unloading rates. The linkage is supported by the commonly observed correlation between rates of photoassimilate import and activities of the sucrose hydrolyzing enzymes, invertase and sucrose synthase. More recently, the relationship has been verified in transgenic plants through overexpression of the enzymes responsible for carbohydrate metabolism. However, it has been found that the rates of phloem unloading vary independently of sink cell sugar levels and turgor pressures in root tips. In mature fasciola stems and developing wheat grains, plasmodesmal conductivity exerts a significant regulation over phloem unloading rates. Optimal plasmodesmal regulation is likely to be mediated at the site of the highest resistance to transport that is the greatest transcellular concentration or osmotic difference. This is located at the sieve element companion cell complexes and vascular parenchyma interface of developing wheat grains, root tips and mature bean stems. It has been demonstrated recently that osmotically induced enhancement of unloading in root tips was associated with increased cross-sectional areas of the cytoplasmic annuli in the neck regions of cortical cells plasmodesmata. How the osmotic changes are transmitted to exhibit such alterations in plasmodesmal ultrastructure is currently unknown. An obvious candidate for a coordinating signal is cell turgor pressure. This is a function of the balance between withdrawal or dilution of osmotically active solutes by sink utilization or growth and their replacement by import from the phloem. Changes in transcellular turgor pressure are known to act directly on plasmodesmal conductivity. An indirect action could result from a turgor induced CA2 positive cascade that may lead to an alteration in plasmodesmal conductivity. The symplasmic concentration of screws that move through the post sieve element pathway is regulated by vacuolar buffering, metabolism and retrieval of sugar leaked to the epiplasmic compartment. In the maternal tissues of developing seeds, rapid exchange of sucrose between cytoplasmic and vacuolar compartments serves to buffer supplies to the filial generation. Turnover of stored starch may contribute to the maintenance of this sucrose transport pool. Now let's understand the mechanism of epiplasmic phloem unloading. Phloem imported solutes exchange to the sink epiplasm from the sieve element companion cell complexes of the axial path and all cells located along the post sieve element pathway. However, significant solute exchange to the sink epiplasm occurs at specific cellular sites. These sites fall into two broad categories that is direct exchange from the sieve element companion cell complexes of the axial path 
or exchange at an epiplasmic step following symplasmic transport from the sieve element companion cell complexes in the terminal sinks. The axial phloem balances unloading from the sieve element companion cell complexes into the lateral sinks with continued translocation to the terminal sinks that in contrast are irreversibly committed to import. Now let's understand the direct effects from the sieve element companion cell complexes. Although possibly equivocal, studies with stem segments, intact stems and isolated vascular strands led to the conclusion that sucrose efflux across the plasma membranes of sieve element companion cell complexes to the phloem epiplasm occurs by simple diffusion down a steep concentration difference. In contrast, sucrose retrieval from the epiplasm by the sieve element companion cell complexes is carrier mediated and energy coupled in symport with protons returning down their electrochemical gradient generated by a plasma membrane H positive ATPase. The scrolls proton symporter SUC2 and a phloem specific isoform of a plasma membrane H positive ATPase or AHA3 are expressed throughout the mature phloem path from source to sink. However, they are not expressed in the protofloem located in growth sinks such as root tips and expanding regions of leaves. Thus, net scrolls efflux from the sieve element companion cell complexes is governed by the difference between the rates of passive leakage and sucrose proton symport retrieval. Regulation of net efflux is dominated by alterations in the activity of scrolls proton symporter. In this context, there is a growing body of evidence that the symporter is turgor regulated. The mechanism of turgor regulation is yet to be elucidated, but it may be mediated through modulation of H positive ATPS activity and hence the proton motive force for sucrose uptake. Now let's understand the efflux to the epiplasm along the post sieve element pathway. Evidences in support of simple or facilitated diffusion as well as energy coupled membrane transport has been reported for photoassimilate efflux from specific cell types located along the post sieve element pathway. For tomato fruit and grape berries, the large transmembrane difference in sucrose concentration across the plasma membranes of the vascular parenchyma cells predict to rates of simple diffusion that are comparable to those observed. In tomato fruit, the steep transmembrane concentration differences are maintained through the hydrolysis of the leaked scrolls by an extracellular invertase. In contrast with the axial phloem, efflux is optimized by a reduced capacity of the vascular tissues to retrieve sugars leaked to the fruit epiplasm. During the pre-storage phase of legume seed development, an extracellular invertase in the seed coats maintains a favorable transmembrane concentration difference to drive sucrose efflux to the seed epiplasm. The extracellular invertase activity is retained by tropical cereals but lost from temperate cereals and grain legumes on the commencement of the storage phase. Here, sucrose efflux from maternal seed tissues occurs by facilitated membrane transport. Dark energy coupling is not an obvious requirement because transmembrane concentration differences may be sufficiently steep to drive facilitated diffusion. 
This assertion is supported by the finding that photoestimulate efflux is insensitive to metabolic inhibitors in seeds of both monocot and dicot species. However, this would not appear to be a universal phenomenon because efflux of sucrose from French and broad bean seed coats is slowed by membrane permanent metabolic inhibitors. In these cases, the response of sucrose efflux to experimentally imposed alterations in the protomotive force are consistent with the operation of a sucrose proton antiporter. Now we will try to understand the process of retrieval as a key component of post sieve element transport. The chemical form in which the sugars are taken up from the sink apoplasm depends upon whether an extracellular invitus is present. Hexose uptake appears to be central to the carbon economy of developing seeds of tropical grasses and tomato fruit. In case of tomato fruit, the hexose proton sympater is considered to play a key role in hexose accumulation. This sympater is located on the plasma membranes of the storage parenchyma cells. Both sucrose and hexose proton sympot activities have been detected in sugar beet tap roots. Comparison of sugar uptake by various protoplast populations suggests that most sugar influx is mediated by the glucose proton sympoter localizer to the phloem parenchyma cells. Following resynthesis in the cytoplasm, sucrose is accumulated in the storage parenchyma vacuoles by a tonoplast sucrose proton antiporter. Sugar flux through both the glucose and sucrose importers is turgor regulated by the turgor sensitive activity of a plasma membrane H positive ATPase. As cell turgor rises, sucrose released back to the root apoplasm could be accumulated by other storage parenchyma cells that had not reached their full sucrose content. The enzyme acid invertase has frequently been implicated in apoplastic phloem unloading. A popular view being that sucrose unloaded to the apoplast is converted to hexoses, thereby allowing the continued exit of sucrose from the phloem. The hexoses may then enter sink cells where they are reconverted to sucrose. Such a mechanism may operate in several sugar storing sinks. It has been suggested that epiplastic unloading might be confined to axial unloading and to those sinks in which symplastic unloading is incompatible with sink function such as in sugar storing sinks where osmotically active solutes are stored against a concentration gradient. While many sinks clearly possess apoplastic invertase activity, there is no direct evidence that the inversion of sucrose occurs in the apoplast surrounding the sieve element companion cell complexes. Furthermore, recent studies utilizing asymmetrically labeled sucrose and the sucrose analog fluorosucrose, a substrate poorly hydrolyzed by invertase have provided evidence that sucrose may be taken up by both sugarcane cells and maize endosperm cells respectively without prior hydrolysis. Thus, although epiplastic invertase is prevalent in money sink tissues, sucrose hydrolysis may not be a prerequisite for the unloading and subsequent input of sugar into the sink cells. Now, moving ahead towards the whole plant perspective. In this, first we will try to understand phloem unloading along the axial path. The nature of phloem unloading along the axial path is dynamic. By responding to the prevailing source sink balance, regulates photoassimilate supply to the terminal sinks. 
high source sink ratio plants accumulate excess photoassimilates along the axial phloem pathway in storage pools. Under these conditions, symplasmic exchange to the lateral storage sites largely occurs by diffusion, particularly where photoassimilates are stored as macromolecules. Concurrent exchange of photoassimilates to and from the epiplasmic pool under the control of a turgor regulated loading mechanism serves to buffer phloem sap concentrations against short term shifts in the source sink balance. As the source sink balance decreases, plasmodesmal conductivity also declines in parallel. Together with turgor regulated loading, such a response would account for the observed increase in partitioning of translocated photoassimilates to terminal sinks under conditions that reduce the source sink ratio. The final state of plasmodesmal closure results in an exclusive epiplasmic unloading route that optimizes control over partitioning between axial path storage and translocation to the terminal sinks. Phloem unloading in terminal sinks. In contrast with the axial pathway, sieve element unloading universally follows a symplasmic route with the possibility of an epiplasmic step located along the post sieve element pathway. As the volume flux of imported phloem sap rises, sieve element unloading by bulk flow is anticipated to be of increasing significance. The influence of unloading by diffusion on the volume flux is restricted to affect the turgor pressure of the importing sieve elements by altering their sap osmotic pressure. For those sinks where symplasmic unloading may occur by bulk flow, the volume flux is rate limited by the transport properties of the post sieve element pathway. That is, the turgor pressure of the recipient sink cells rather than that of the importing sieve elements sets the pressure difference and the interconnecting plasmodesmata govern the overall hydraulic conductance of the transport path from source to sink. This was all about today's lecture. Thank you.